Hi, this is Brent with Emotiva Audio, and today I'm going to show you a couple of examples of our subwoofer models and talk about the different connection types available and run through the basics on how you might set up each of these subs for either a two-channel music system or your home theater system. So the two Emotiva subwoofer models we have up here is our, our Basics SE12 sub and then our, our new Airmotive XS8 sub. And of course we have these in 10, 12, and, and soon coming a 15 inch model. Um, and wanted to use these two different subs to illustrate the different connection types available on the sub um, because you, know, you can already see some differences and to go through you know, how you might need to configure the settings on the back of these subs for either a home theater uh, installation or with a 2.1 uh, music only system. And so uh, off the bat, we can see that uh, the input connection types on these two subwoofers differ slightly. Um, on the XS sub, we have a, a summed RCA two channel input as well as a single balanced XLR input. Whereas on the SE sub, we, we get a few different input types, uh, a summed RCA two channel input, a single yellow LFE input. And we'll kind of talk about what those LFE distinctions mean on the sub here in a second. And we get speaker level or high level inputs that can be connected directly to an amplifier. And so I'm not gonna talk about the benefits or differences between using high level versus line level input People have very strong opinions on that. That's not what we're getting into today. Just want to tell you how to connect these subs and always encourage you um, to try you know, multiple ways of connecting the subs because there are multiple options available and see what works best in your system. Um, so first, let's talk about the input that is in common between these two subs. We have a, a single uh, input that's a left and right red and white RCA input. And on both of these subs, and this applies to a lot of subs in general, these are summed together once they get into the sub. And so we give two, a left and a right, so that if you're using a two channel preamp that doesn't already have a summed uh, subwoofer output, we can still get both channels of information to the sub where they're then summed internally to the sub. And so if you're using a preamp that only has a single subwoofer output connection, you can use either uh, of the red or the white inputs here. Um, same thing on the XS sub. Of course, the one that, that is designated LFE, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, is, is typically the one we would want to use if only using a single uh, subwoofer input from your preamp. Um, and so, you know, th those are just standard RCA inputs. These are going to accept a full range signal from your preamp, and then your crossover that you're going to set up in the sub, which we'll talk about in a second, will deal with any, any base management. Um, and so, you know, we've talked about the, the red and white inputs. Let's talk about the, the difference between this yellow input labeled LFE here and, and why one of these inputs is labeled LFE over here. Um, and so LFE, low frequency effects, that's typically, you know, referred to as the 0.1 track in like a 5.1 surround sound setup or, or 2.1, you know, is often LFE or, or the subwoofer track. Um, but with, with subwoofers, Often LFE means that I'm not going to use the crossover within the subwoofer. Usually we're going to use the LFE input if we're using a, a, an AV processor or a receiver that's already doing the base management and crossover for us. That way, when we use the LFE input on this SE12, this LFE input is bypassing the crossover so that that's not in the signal path. It's just relying on the upstream components, the processor, the receiver, to do the crossing over for you. And that's nice because, you know, anytime we can remove a piece of circuitry from the signal path, it, it can help, uh, you know, clean things up. Now, we get a separate LFE input on the, the SE12 sub. So if you don't want to use the internal crossover of the sub, we use the LFE input. If you do, we could use either or both of the red and white inputs. On the XS sub, it's a little different. Notice the LFE is labeled as part of these stereo RCA inputs. So we don't just get to use that input and it bypasses the crossover. On this sub, we'll notice that there is a crossover setting for LFE. And in this case, instead of getting a separate input to bypass uh, the internal crossover, we simply turn that crossover knob all the way up to LFE, which takes the crossover out of the path 
and allows the, uh, the receiver or processor to do the crossing over. And so LFE is typically used in a, uh, a surround sound setup where you have something else external doing crossing over for you. Um, you know, some of our uh, even two channel preamps like the PT2, um, the, the TA2 integrated amp, they have fully adjustable crossovers on the subwoofer output. So you could use the LFE input there to rely on those preamp crossovers. But if you're sending a full range signal to the sub, you're gonna need the sub to kind of do some of that crossing over at some point and, and decide where it's gonna start playing. And so in that case, you know, we, we would not wanna use LFE um, and use the crossover of the sub instead. Um, and so, you know, that's the distinction between the stereo RCA inputs, the red and white, and what we mean when we say LFE. It's just, do I want to use the subwoofer's crossover or do I not want to use in the LFE setting so that my receiver processor is handling the bass management? Um, and so, you know, those are, are kind of common inputs between the two, but the inputs that are completely different are our high-level speaker inputs on the SE12 and then our balanced input on the XS8. And I think that those inputs available on each sub kind of speaks to what those subwoofers are best suited for. The XS subs, um, you know, being a ported sub, especially while they do very good with music, um, this, this single balanced XLR input is really more meant to be used with a, in a surround sound setting with a receiver or processor that is a balanced subwoofer output. Of course, balanced connections are great for long cable runs that you may need to use with a subwoofer. It's in like the back of the room or far away from your processor or receiver. Uh, and so, you know, the balanced input when you can use it, if you have a balanced output, Put going to the sub is a great option um, to use uh, to reduce noise and things like that. Whereas the high level inputs, these are speaker binding posts and they are meant to be connected to an amplifier just like another speaker would be. And effectively, instead of taking a low level kind of preamp level input here, they can actually take an amplifier output uh, level and, and reduce it down to a usable level for the sub. Again, not gonna get into which is better. I recommend that you try both, uh, just depending on your setup and decide which one is better, but, but people feel strongly about that. But effectively, this allows you to take your two channel amplifier or your preamp that maybe doesn't have a, a set of, uh, of subwoofer outs or doesn't have pre-outs and just connect the amplifier outputs for your left front and right speakers to each of these uh, binding posts here. You just run a second pair of speaker wire from the same binding post that's connecting your speaker to each of these. Of course, making sure to not short anything between black and red binding posts, uh, banana plugs are always recommended there. Um, but, but this just gives you another way to send signal to that subwoofer from two channels and, and more designed for a two channel system because it's only gonna receive input from the two channels that are connected uh, to that input there. All right, so we've talked about kind of the different connection types available on the subwoofers and when you might use them, kind of what the, the differences are. Um, but I also wanna do a quick rundown on all the settings available on the subwoofers. And I'll go ahead and point out, these settings on these Emotiva subwoofers are fairly uh, general. They're not necessarily specific just to Emotiva subs. They'll apply to a lot of make and model subs. Um, and, and so, you know, obviously there's some specifics to these models, but in general, um, these will just be kind of some good rules of thumb as you're just kind of setting up your subwoofer for the first time. And so, you know, there, there's some different controls that are, that are all in common between these, but they, they mean something slightly different. Um, the, the first thing we see, um, th this little toggle I wanna to talk about that's available on both of these subs is the auto or the on a power switch. And of course we have the main power switch here, which would need to be flipped on uh, to at least get mains power to the subwoofer. But this uh, little power switch uh, tells us how the, uh, the subwoofer is gonna operate in and out of standby. If we set this to on, on either of these subs, the subwoofer will just stay on, right? It's just gonna be on. The only way it's gonna turn off is if you reach back and flip the switch and turn it off. Um, and so in general, often we'll, we'll leave our, our subwoofers in the auto mode, which means that the subwoofer is only going to turn on when it senses an input signal at any of the inputs that is strong enough to meet its threshold of triggering. And so, um, you know, try using the sub in the auto mode. Uh, it should trigger on when it receives a signal strong enough. Um, a piece of advice I'll give you, if the subwoofer is not triggering on in time, uh, you feel like you have to send it too strong of a signal in order to get it to trigger on, one thing you can do is go in your processor, go in your receiver, and you can boost the level of the signal that's being sent to the sub in the preamp processor or receiver so that the signal at the input is a little bit stronger 
And then to compensate so that the overall output of the sub is not too loud, you can simply turn down the volume or the gain setting on the sub, and that can help it trigger on uh, with a little bit, uh, you know, lower overall volume in the uh, in the system. Um, but just to, to move on past the, the auto uh, feature, which, you know, auto, if you're playing test tones or doing room correction, if the sub is not on and it has to rely on that input signal to trigger on, um, you know, that can cause you to like miss the beginning of a test tone or a sample if the sub is not fully powered on. So if you're doing room correction or playing test tones, it's a good idea to flip that to on so that the sub doesn't have to wake up. It's ready to, to play that test tone right away for your measurements. Um, so moving on, you know, talking about the crossover, there are really three settings that we have to pay attention to with our crossover. Um, and the first one, I think the easiest um, to, to talk about is just the volume setting on the sub. Sometimes this is known as gain on a subwoofer, level, volume. They effectively all mean the same thing, but this simply just turns the level of the subwoofer up and down. And this is a great tool because, you know, obviously we'll control the volume of the subwoofer with the overall system volume control as we're using it, but this volume control allows us to change the level of only the subwoofer to blend it in nicely with the rest of your system. So obviously, you know, if your, your processor AVR has a sub-level control, you can alter the level of the sub within the settings there, but you should be encouraged to also use the volume settings on the back of the subwoofer to blend the subwoofer in uh, with your system. And when you're first setting up a sub, if you're unsure of how loud it's going to be or where it's going to perform, I suggest setting that volume to 50% for initial playback back, just leave it right there in the middle, and, and that'll ensure that it's it's likely loud enough that you get good playback, but not overpoweringly loud if, if for some reason the signal sent to the sub is very strong. So, you know, starting with the volume in the middle is always a good starting point when you're first configuring your sub with your system. Um, now let's let's talk about our, our crossover setting, and this is one that, that I think is, is maybe the most critical for setting up your sub. Now, while the volume sets the level of your sub up and down, the crossover sets the frequency frequency at which the subwoofer will begin playing and then play everything below that crossover frequency, right? So crossover, that, that allows us to blend the subwoofer in with the rest of our system at different frequencies. Now, if you're using the subwoofer for home theater, that likely means your processor, your receiver are already doing the crossover for you. So this goes back to what we talked about with our LFE inputs. If I'm using this SE12 for, for home theater, I'm just going to use the LFE input and that's going to bypass my crossover completely. Here on the XS8, uh, I would use the LFE input or the balanced input if that's available. And then to, to bypass the crossover, I just slide that knob up to LFE, takes the crossover out of the picture. Um, but for, for two-channel music, where you have a preamp that maybe doesn't do crossing over, um, like our PT2, for example, that has some built-in adjustable crossover, if you're sending a full-range signal to the sub, well, the sub is not going to play, you know, the full range. It's going to only play up to maybe, you know, two 200 hertz or something like that and, and even strain to do that. But even so, we likely don't want our sub playing that high. Um, for example, if my, my main speakers roll off at, at 60 hertz, then I may only want the sub to come in and play, you know, 60 hertz and below. And so, you know, it's always a good idea. You can, of course, just set the crossover in, in the middle setting to start. But rather than just, you know, kind of guessing at where that crossover point needs to be, um, if I want to blend in a subwoofer with a set of speakers, and, and let's just use that 60 hertz as an example. I'm going to look at the, the frequency range measured of the speakers that I'm using and say they go from, you know, 60 hertz to 20 kilohertz of usable frequency. Well, if those speakers are naturally rolling off at 60 hertz, then 60 hertz would be a great place to kind of start my crossover. And so I may roll that down to 60. And then that's typically about as low as we'll go on a crossover point for the sub. Now, if I'm using like a smaller bookshelf speaker, maybe those roll off more like it at 80 hertz, you know, of usable frequency. So I may bump that up a little bit uh, closer to 80, kind of guess at where that is and start there with my crossover. Now, if you say set your volume at 50%, the crossover based on, you know, approximately where your main speakers roll off, that's a great starting point, but you likely will have to adjust the volume control of the sub and adjust the crossover control of the sub, listening after each adjustment and kind of determining by ear, um, you know, how that sub is blending in with the rest of your speakers. And so it can take a little bit um, to, to kind of tune those controls on the sub, but using those volume controls and crossover controls, it will be necessary to kind of tweak until you get a sound you like. Of course, you can always use, uh, you know, measurements, use something like Room EQ Wizard to measure the sub and the speakers and, and, you know, be more scientific about it. But in general, you know, we can just 
kind of play by ear and, and use our ears to set up our, our crossover and level controls. Um, and so the, the last thing that's in common between both of these subs, it's, it's set up a little bit differently, is our phase control. And so here um, on the SE12, we see we get an option for zero, or 180, right? Zero, 180, it's, it's kind of a binary switch, right? We only get two options. Well, on the XS subs, we get a range from zero to 180, right? So we get to decide, um, you know, we have a little bit more variability in there. And so I'm not gonna get into, you know, the specifics of how to set a variable phase like this and, and get the exact phasing right. I'm just gonna kind of give you a basic rule of thumb to, to make sure you're at least in the right, right ballpark with your subwoofer. Um, so when I'm first setting up my sub, I'm always gonna start with the phase at zero, right? Zero means that, um, you know, if things are in phase, that means that the black and red and black and red positives and negatives are all lined up correctly all the way through to your main speakers, all the way through to the sub. But sometimes if an amplifier inverts the signal, a preamp inverts the signal, or maybe the sub's amplifier is inverting relative to the rest of, of the system, what we can do is flip the phase uh, and reverse it, which effectively would be the same as taking all your speaker wires and just swapping the red and black connectors on one end. Um, we're just changing the negative and positive uh, connections there on the speakers, changing when the sub is pushing versus pulling so that the sound waves are lined up with one another, they're in phase. Otherwise, if say your, your speakers are playing one phase and we have the subs phase reversed, those sound waves in the low frequencies will oppose and cancel each other out. And so in general, start with zero percent, or sorry, zero degrees, and listen to the bass response of your system. Then flip the phase to 180 and listen to the bass response of your system. Whichever setting gives you the most perceived bass in your room is likely the correct phase. Most often that's gonna be 180, or sorry, zero to start. Sometimes 180 is necessary depending on what the other components are doing regarding phase in your system. We, we don't always know what's happening upstream from the subwoofers, so that phase control is meant to allow us to, you know, adjust and flip that as needed. Now, the same thing can be true with the variable phase. Um, you know, there are other resources you can find on how to exactly tune in the variable phase, you know, in between somewhere in zero and 180, but I'm effectively gonna do the same thing on, on a basic setup. Try it at zero degrees phase first, listen to the bass response, flip it all the way to 180, and listen to the bass response there again. Now, you may find that you can find a setting, you know, that's in between those two values that gives you even better bass response, but listening at zero and then listening at 180 and deciding which is giving you better bass response will at least tell you which end of the spectrum uh, to start looking for that better value on. But again, it's a little bit more of an involved process to get the exact phase dialed in. So there's, there's one other setting on the XS sub that's not available on the SE12, and that's this LF or low frequency boost setting. Um, this occurs at, uh, at uh, I believe 30 hertz and can either go up to nine dB of boost or all the way down to minus three dB if you wanna cut the bass a little bit. Uh, I suggest leaving that at zero for initial setup so that you just get the flat response of the sub. And then, you know, you can obviously add some more or, or decrease it from there just by ear. But, but, you know, starting at zero is always a great idea for the low frequency boost. Thanks for joining us today. And hopefully this video was helpful in deciding which sub may be right for you, how to connect to them, and get you started in setting them up in your system. From everyone here at Emotiva, happy listening.